Great. Well, it's uh, it's great to see you back, everybody. How is everybody doing on your second week of classes? Good. All right. So quickly, let's go ahead and recap what we talked about last time. So last time we introduced the idea of a system that takes some input and produces some output. And we classified these systems into a variety of types. Uh, so in the last class, we looked at static versus dynamic systems. We looked at single versus multivariable systems. Uh, we talked about linear versus nonlinear systems, time varying versus time invariant systems, and continuous time versus discrete time systems. And I gave you uh, some examples of, of each of these types of systems. Uh, and I derived uh, a couple of systems for real world civil engineering problems. Um, and then at the very end of class, I concluded with kind of a summary of the types of systems we'll be talking about in this class. Um, so for the purposes of this class, we'll be primarily looking at systems that are dynamic in time. Uh, we'll be looking at both single and multivariable systems. So for about the first half of the course, we'll be looking at single variable dynamical systems. Uh, for the second half of the course, we'll be looking at multivariable systems. Okay, so we'll be, we'll be examining both of these in this course. Uh, in this class, we'll be primarily looking at systems that are linear. Uh, although I will show you techniques for dealing with nonlinear systems, um, in particular techniques for uh, linearizing those systems to make them more uh, amenable to analysis or to simulate them, uh, we're going to be looking primarily at time invariant systems. And we'll be looking at both continuous and discrete time systems, but the emphasis is primarily going to be on continuous time systems. Um, most of the intuition for working with discrete time systems comes right out of working with continuous time systems. So we're gonna primarily focus on uh, continuous time systems and a lot of that, um, knowledge is going to transfer over to discrete time systems as well. Okay, are there any uh, remaining questions from last time on the various types of systems uh, and the types of systems we'll be dealing with in this class in particular? So it can be, it can be either one. Uh, you can have a multivariable system with a single output. Yeah, yeah. So it may be that you have a uh, like a large uh, truss system if you're looking at a structural system, or if you're looking at a river network, you might have you know multiple reaches in the river, but you may only have uh, a sensor located on one truss member or one uh, river branch, in which case your output will be a, a single scalar uh, number. Right. So. So yes, it is possible for a multivariable system to have a single output. Okay, any other questions on the various system types? Okay, so let's move on. Today, we're going to formally introduce linear time invariant dynamical systems. So the abbreviation that I'll be using for those systems is LTI. You'll see this abbreviation a lot, both in this class uh, and in the literature. So we're going to be primarily looking at linear time invariant dynamical systems. So we'll formally introduce them today. We'll state the standard form for LTI systems. So uh, essentially the form for which any LTI system can be expressed. We will introduce uh, an alternative form for expressing LTI systems called uh, operator form or operator notation. And we'll show how it can be used to gain some intuition about this, how the system will behave. And finally, we're gonna formulate some LTI models for uh, illustrative civil engineering problems. Okay, great. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Today, we're going to be talking about LTI dynamical systems. 
Let me go ahead and write that out. LTI dynamical systems. Okay. And we'll be concerned with two types. The first are continuous time systems. And these are described by what type of equations? What type of equations describes LTI, continuous time dynamical systems? What type of equation describes a continuous time dynamical system? Right, it's described by a differential equation. Very good. So these are described by differential equations. So differential equations, uh, you'll find um, often the real world mechanical behavior of the civil engineering systems we're interested in will just naturally be described by differential equations uh, that come out of applying uh, conservation of mass, conservation of energy. Uh, so it's a very useful tool for describing the behavior, uh, the dynamical behavior of civil engineering systems, okay? And kind of the prototypical differential equation um, can be described as follows. Uh, so this is a single variable uh, first order differential equation. Uh, dy by dt is equal to some constant alpha times y of t. Okay, so this is kind of our uh, prototypical first order differential equation, which is stating essentially that the rate of change of our variable y is proportional to the current value of y, right? So the rate of change of y is equal to some constant alpha times the current value of y at time t. Okay, so this is kind of the, uh, uh, the prototypical first order differential equation. Um, the other type of system we'll be dealing with are discrete time systems. Okay, and what type of equation describes discrete time dynamical systems? Right, so these are described by difference equations, discrete time difference equations. And kind of the prototypical example of a first order discrete time difference equation uh, is the following, which is analogous to our continuous time case. Uh, we have that y at time k plus one is equal to some constant a times y at time k. Right. So the, the value of y at the next time step is equal to some constant a times the value of y at the current time step. Um, so just looking at these two types of equations here, what, what kind of behavior do these, these two equations uh, model? So what kind of behavior does an does a equation like this model? Right, so it models either uh, exponential growth or exponential decay right, for this kind of prototypical first order dynamical system, All right? Are there any questions on um, these two different types of systems, the terminology that I've used so far? Right, so you'll actually show this in your homework, uh, but what, what these equations are saying is that um, when you solve when you solve an equation like this, you're finding a form for y such that when you plug it in, the left hand side and the right hand side are equal. Okay? And what you'll find is if you let y be the exponential function for the continuous time case, this equation will be satisfied. Okay? But also kind of um, more intuitively, maybe 
if you look at this discrete time system, it's saying that the value of y at the next time step is equal to some constant times y at the current time step, right? So if you're looking at, for instance, bacterial growth or something like that, that growth will be described by a model like this, and it will be uh, exponential in nature. Okay. Cool. Are there any other questions on these uh, on the terminology that I've used so far? Okay, we'll give some concrete examples uh, in a little bit. Okay, so let's uh, let's concentrate right now on the continuous time systems. So let's look at continuous time models. Again, these are described by uh, differential equations. So let's consider a continuous time system. I'll just write it as CT system. I'll draw our little block diagram. So we have our system. We have some input UT hook them and some output yt, okay? And as I mentioned before, these are described by differential equations. So I'm just gonna, gonna kind of hammer this point home. Okay. So for instance, we might have that our system is described by the following first order equation dy by dt plus a times y is equal to our input u. Right. Or we might have uh, a more complicated nonlinear equation. Uh, let's say a higher order nonlinear equation. So we have the third derivative of y, our output with respect to time, uh, plus y squared times the second derivative of y with respect to time is equal to some uh, you know nonlinear function of our input sine of u. Okay. So let's just go uh, let's go over some terminology here. We say that the order, I'll go back to that in a second, the order of the system, is the highest derivative. So I'll often be saying first order system, second order system. The order of the system is the highest derivative with respect to time. Okay, so a quick quiz here. What is the order of this first system here? Okay, this is first order. What's the order of this second system here? This is third order, right? Uh, and another another quick question: Is this first system linear or nonlinear? Linear. What about this second system here? This is nonlinear. Okay. So we'll find um, we'll find pretty quickly that for linear systems, it's generally pretty easy to find a solution uh, for the general case. For nonlinear systems, we generally won't be able to find a closed form solution. Okay. So the order of the system is the highest derivative, and these systems are generally defined over a time interval, okay. which I will write uh, as from going from t naught, our start time, to tf, uh, our ending time. Okay. Great. Uh, so I'll go ahead and show you um, for continuous time models like this, any LTI model can be expressed in the following form. Okay. So this is the standard form for a LTI system in continuous time. Essentially on the left-hand side, we have constants A sub N, A sub N minus one, all the way to a naught being multiplied by uh, derivatives of our output uh, from order zero to n. Okay. So the left-hand side of the equation uh, you know, is essentially the output and its derivatives 
uh, with respect to time scaled by some set of constants a naught through a n. And the right hand side is the same story except for the inputs of the system. Okay, so the right hand side we have the inputs uh, and their derivatives um, from order zero through m, as in Mike, scaled by some set of constants um, b naught through b m. Okay, so this is the standard form through which any a uh, single variable LTI system can be expressed. Um, so are these constants, do these constants A naught through A N change in time? No, why is that? Right, because it's a linear time invariant system. Cool, just wanted to, to quiz you there. Okay, so, but uh, this, this is the standard form for an LTI system essentially any single variable LTI system we can write like this. Okay? And we will be doing that later on in class today. There's an alternative way of writing um, LTI systems that I want to show you. And that is called writing them in operator form. Okay, so let me, let me go ahead and introduce the idea of operators. Okay, so the key idea is that our derivatives d by dt uh, and its higher order versions can be expressed as a linear operator, which we will just call p. Okay. So in other words, d by dt, we're going to call this p. The second derivative, we're going to call p squared. Right? And the nth derivative, as in November, this will be p to the n. Okay. So we're kind of overloading notation here. Note that you know p squared is not literally the derivative squared because that operation doesn't really exist. Uh, what we're doing here is we're going to express our LTI system in operator notation because it's gonna allow us to uh, apply some intuition from working with polynomials uh, to the problem of working with linear differential equations. Okay? And in particular, we'll be able to, by expressing systems in this form, we'll be able to kind of understand what their behavior looks like just by looking at um, looking at those equations as if they are polynomials, okay? So this is called putting the system in operator form. Okay, so what we can do is we can go back here and let's go ahead and re-express this. Um, let's go ahead and re-express this. Let me see if I can duplicate this page real quick. And if I can't, I'm just gonna go ahead and write over it. But let's take this standard form for an LTI system and let's re-express this in terms of operator notation. So, so note here, I'm saying d by dt is equal to p. So this implies that dy by dt is equal to py. Okay, that's how we're going to write it. It's not literally p multiplied by y, but this is the notation we'll be expressing it uh, in. Okay, similarly, d squared y by dt squared, we'll be expressing as p squared y and the nth derivative of y with respect to t will express as p to the n y. Okay, so let's go back. Let's re-express this in operator form. Okay, so what does this, what does this expression here become? What does this uh, dNy by dTn become in operator form? Right, it'll be p to the n y. Okay, so let's go ahead and write that out. This becomes p to the n y. Okay, what about this one here? 
on this this become right so it'll become p n minus one y uh this one here p y and this one here what does this one become just y right good just testing okay uh this one here what does this become Right, p to the mu, and you can probably see the pattern here. This one will become p to the m as in Mike minus one u. Okay, and all of these uh, will just uh, proceed in the same kind of pattern. Okay, so just checking if I can duplicate the page. Not sure how to do it here. Okay, let's just let's just write it all out. Okay, so what we can do is now that we have it written like this, let's go ahead and uh, treat it like it's a polynomial. And we can take this first line here, and we can factor out the y. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. We'll end up with the following expression. Sorry, changed my uh, my pen settings here. All right, so we will have a n p to the n plus a n minus one p to the n minus one plus dot 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 plus a one p plus a naught all times y t. Okay. And we can do the same thing to the other side of the equation. We can factor out our input u. And what we'll get is bm, as in Mike, times p to the m plus b m minus 1, p m minus 1, plus dot, 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 plus b naught, all times ut. Okay, so note, uh, I just wanna, wanna say again, this is not literally the same thing as P to the N times YT. We're just kind of overloading the notation here. Um, and it's, you're going to see why in a little bit. It's gonna help us kind of build some intuition for what the behavior of our systems are going to be like. Okay, so now we can take this whole thing. Let's take this expression here in parentheses. And let's call this, let's call this dp. So dp is going to be this entire thing uh, in parentheses here. Let me just put it in green, make it more clear. And let's take this entire expression here and let's call this expression, let's call this np. And now we can simplify how we write our system. Okay. We can write our entire system in the compact representation, dp applied to yt is equal to np applied to ut. Okay. And we can simplify this even more so that we can write our output y uh, as a function of our input u, let's take this dp and put it over on the other side. And we get that our output yt is equal to some operator np over dp applied to ut. Okay. Or more succinctly, we can simplify this even further. This entire uh, rational expression here will become lp, and we can express our output as equal to some operator LP applied to our input UT. So this is called writing the sister, uh, writing the system in operator form. Okay, uh, where LP is our system operator. 
It is an operator that takes in some input and produces an output Y of T. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll get into how we can model this in a little bit, but I just want you to think about uh, this expression LP is rep representing some operator that we apply to our input and it yields our output. LP describes essentially the entire system. Okay. Are there any questions about this uh, before I move on? It'll become a little bit more clear why I did this. Um, you might be wondering uh, what this is for. Uh, I'll show you in a little bit, okay? Are there any questions before I move on? Any questions? Okay, so let's go ahead and apply this operator form to some civil engineering problems so we can see uh, what it looks like and what information it gives us about the system. Okay. All right, so let's go back to our good old friend, the structural system. Okay, so as before, we have a structural system, a beam or a floor supported by two beams that are connected to the ground. Okay. We have some force applied to the structure, F of T. Uh, this may be an earthquake. It may be a crane hitting the building or something like that. It's just some force that's being applied to excite this system. And that force induces a displacement XT. Okay. So this is the displacement of the structure from its resting position. Uh, and as before, the structure has some mass M. And we can treat the supporting beams uh, kind of like they are springs with some spring constant or stiffness K. Okay? So when you hit the structure with a force, those, those springs will react and attempt to uh, restore the structure to its original position. So we can write out this system. Um, we can idealize the structural system as a spring mass, uh, spring mass system. So this is kind of how we are conceptualizing it. You may re remember this from uh, your undergraduate uh, differential equations class, but we have a mass, which I will denote M. The mass is attached to some spring with a stiffness K, and that spring is attached to a support. Okay, We have some force input that's applied to the spring, and that force induces a displacement X of T. So we can idealize our structural system right now as a spring mass system, okay? And how did we uh, derive the equations of motion for this structural system in the last class? Sorry? Right, so we applied uh, Newton's second law to derive the equation for the dynamical behavior of this system. So uh, again, we have that the sum of forces acting on the spring mass system is equal to the mass times the acceleration. Uh, and remember that we can express acceleration as the second derivative uh, of the displacement with respect to time. Okay, uh, so what were the forces again? Acting on this, uh, acting on this system, right? So we have the applied force F of T. This is the exogenous force that's coming from outside the system. What other forces were acting on this system? Right. So the uh, the spring force, which resists uh, the applied force. So we'll call that uh, K times X of T. Okay. Uh, so in other words, the uh, the force applied by the spring is directly proportional to the displacement. Okay, and that we have is equal to the mass times the second derivative of the displacement with respect to time. Okay, very good. Uh, let's go ahead and rewrite this so that we have the output over on the left-hand side and the input on the right-hand side. We have... Um, the mass times the second derivative of the displacement with respect to time uh, plus 
spring force kxt is equal to our input force f of t. All right, let's go ahead and go back um, to our standard form. Um, and let's try to see if we can express our system using kind of this standard framework, okay? So we have that um, over on the left-hand side, we have coefficients A2, A1, and A0. So those are the coefficients applied to the outputs. And we also have a coefficient applied to the input B0, okay? So if we're expressing the system in terms of these coefficients, what will A2 be? So if we're taking this system here uh, and we're writing it as, uh, let me see. We're taking this system here and we're writing it in terms of A2 d squared xt by dt squared plus a1 dx t by dt plus a naught x of t is equal to b naught times u of t. Our input is equal to the force, so I'll just write this as f of t. What are our values for a2, a1, a naught, and b0? Let's just write them out explicitly. Okay, so what is a2 equal to? Mass, right? What is A1 equal to? Zero, right? There's no first order term in our equations of motion yet. Okay, what is A0 equal to? Okay. And what is B0 equal to? One. Okay. So uh, that's exactly correct. We can express our equations of motion for the spring mass system uh, as if it were in the standard form of a LTI uh, system, okay? We just substitute in the coefficients. So let's go ahead and take this expression and let's put it in operator form. I'll just give you a second to write down. Did you have a question? No, no question. Okay, so let's go ahead and take this equation here, let's write it in operator form. Okay, so in operator form, we have that our original equation was M times acceleration plus K times displacement is equal to F of T. So let's just go ahead and substitute in our, our P's for these derivatives. What we'll get is, uh, we'll have mp squared uh, times x of t plus k x t is equal to f of t, right? And we can go ahead and we can factor out this x of t. So we'll end up with mp squared plus k all times x of t is equal to f of t. And let's go ahead and rearrange this so that we have the output on the left-hand side, the input on the right-hand side, just like before. And what we get is x of t is equal to one over mp squared plus k, all times f of t. All right, so in operator form, Essentially, our system, the operator that describes our system, looks like a rational polynomial, right? With one on the top and this polynomial looking expression on the bottom, mp squared plus k. Now, no, this isn't literally a polynomial. We're just acting like the, uh, the differentials are uh, polynomial terms, okay? And what, what is the behavior of this system? 
uh, if you recall from last time. So what happens if we have our spring mass system, we come along, it's at rest, and we whack it with a hammer. What will what will the behavior look like, right? So it's gonna it's gonna vibrate. Let's draw out a graph of what it looks like. Okay, so this is t. This is time. The y-axis is x of t. And if we come along and we whack the system with a hammer. You will get kind of a sinusoidal curve like this, right? So you hit the system with a hammer, the mass will displace over to the right. The spring force will act in direct proportion to the displacement. So that's going to push the mass back to the left. The spring again will react to that displacement and force the system over to the right again, and it will continue to oscillate. Does this system ever come to rest? or does this continue to oscillate forever, right? So we discussed, we discussed last time that this system actually oscillates forever, right? There's no, there's no force that will cause the system to come to rest, right? So this isn't, this isn't the most realistic model for a structural system because we know intuitively that that wouldn't actually happen, right? If you had a structure and you whacked it with a hammer, um, it would eventually come to rest. So we can model that type of system by adding what's called damping to the system. What we're going to have to do is add another force uh, to the system. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay. So here we have a structural system with damping. Does anyone remember damping from undergraduate differential equations? You might have encountered this at some point. Uh, so again, we have the same structural system as before. You know, a beam or a story supported by two beams. Okay. Again, our structure has a mass M. There is some input force, which we'll call f of t that induces a displacement that we'll call x of t. And now our supports, they have a stiffness k that describes the springiness of those supports, but they'll also have a damping coefficient c, okay? So if we idealize this system as a mass connected to a spring, what we now have is a mass connected to a spring, which is connected to our support. Okay, that spring has a stiffness K. And now we have an additional element, which I will call a damper. Okay, and that damper, we usually denote like this. Okay. And that damper has some damping coefficient C. Um, so in real life, a, a damping can, you know, uh, it may represent frictional forces in the structure that cause it to eventually come to rest, uh, deformation uh, in the structure. Uh, but the key idea is as follows. Okay, we know that the spring force F k of t is equal to the stiffness k times the displacement x of t. Our damping force, which I'll call fc of t, is equal to the damping constant c times the velocity. Okay, so the force, um, the force within the, the damper is equal to c times dx t by dt. Okay. In other words, for our for our damper, the faster you push on it, the more it pushes back. Right? If you push on it very slowly, the force exerted by the damper uh, in reaction will be relatively small. If you try to push really fast, the damper will resist. Okay. So that's kind of intuitively how you can think about this. Uh, 
Okay, so let's go ahead and apply Newton's second law again, F equals MA. Okay, what are our forces now? So we have F of T, our applied input. What other forces? Okay, yeah, right. So we'll also have um, minus KXT minus M, right, C times DXT by DT is equal to mass times uh, acceleration, which I'll write uh, DX squared T by DT squared. Okay. Um, we can write this in the standard form as M times D squared X of T by DT squared plus C DX of T by DT plus K X of T is equal to F of T. So this is our model of the structural system with damping. Let's go ahead and take this and put it in operator form. And I'll just give you a second to write that down. Okay, are there any questions about this derivation? Give you a second. Okay, so writing this in operator form, we can take that uh, left hand side and factor out the x. What we'll get is mp squared plus cp plus k all times x of t is equal to f of t. And again, expressing it in input output form with the output over on the left hand side, we get that X of T is equal to one over MP squared plus CP plus K all times F of T. Note that I keep saying times here. It's not really times, it's uh, the operator applied to our input. Right. But we can think about it as if it's a polynomial right now, a rational polynomial. Okay, so what's the what's the difference between this denominator here and the one we had previously? Right, there's this first order term now, CP. Okay, so let's go ahead and draw out what the behavior of this system looks like. We take our new structural system with damping and we hit it with a hammer, what you'll get is something that looks like this. Okay, so it'll oscillate just like before, but because of the damping force, that oscillation will begin to decay. Okay, until it eventually, as time goes to infinity, the system comes to rest. So this is much a much more realistic model. Um, and the difference was that damping term that applies a force that is proportional to the velocity. Okay. So this will be important later when we get to controls um, because sometimes we'll want to emulate this damping force with a controller in order to stabilize uh, a system and make it come to rest. Okay, now there's a way here there's something about this polynomial here that will allow us to know what the behavior of the system is just by looking at it. Okay, what do you think it is about this polynomial that'll let us tell whether the system will oscillate forever or whether it comes to rest? Does anybody know what aspect of that polynomial defines that behavior? What's the diff what are the differences between this, this expression here and the one for the spring mass system? 
Does anyone know what specifically it is that will tell us whether the system decays or will continue to oscillate forever? It is, right? Um, but it's also possible to have a linear term and have the system have no oscillations at all, right? Uh, that's something we'll find a little bit later on. There's something specifically about these polynomials, and I use the word uh, polynomial kind of in a suggestive way here, that allow us to know what the system's behavior will be ahead of time. Sorry? So the polynomial itself isn't what's defining this curve here. So um, it's not that the, the polynomial literally has a zero. Um, there's something about this, this polynomial, um, and I will just, uh, I'll leave you in suspense right now. But think about, uh, think about, go all the way back to algebra one. Think about what you did with polynomials. Right. So it turns out that the aspect that governs what the response will be is defined by the roots of this polynomial. And this polynomial here is what we call the characteristic polynomial of the system. Okay. And in subsequent lectures, we'll go a bit into what the roots of this polynomial mean and what values of those roots determine which behaviors of the system that we'll see. And later on, how can we change the roots of this equation using feedback control to get the behavior that we want? Okay. So good refresher on, uh, on differential equations. Um, it's the roots, it's the roots, everybody. Okay, so let's go and let's look at a different kind of system now. We looked at the structural system for a while. Let's look at a different kind of system. Here we're going to look at a circuit. Let's look at an RLC circuit. Okay. 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 So we have a circuit with a resistor, an inductor, and a capacitor. So uh, I know that many of you probably haven't seen circuits in a while. So let's go over this kind of slowly. Um, but we'll see that it produces a very familiar looking equation at the very end. Okay, so we have some voltage source supplying a voltage difference of VT. This might be a battery. Uh, we have the trace coming out like this with a resistor with some resistance R. Okay, on the right-hand side here, we'll have an inductor. So who remembers inductors in physics circuits? Okay. So an inductor is a device that uh, stores energy in a magnetic field. Essentially, we'll see what it does for our circuit in a bit. And on the bottom side, we have a capacitor. Okay. This consists of two charged plates. Okay. Um, and let's go ahead uh, and look at each of these elements in isolation and kind of describe what their constitutive equations are. Um, so I know several of you here are kind of in the water domain. So I'll give kind of a, uh, a hydraulic analogy a bit later on. I see Jimmy smiling. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's not a perfect analogy, but it will be useful for building intuition here. Okay, so let's look at each of these elements. So we've seen the resistor before. Okay, a resistor will denote like this, kind of this jagged line. Okay, it has a resistance R. And from Ohm's law, we know that the voltage drop over the resistor, I'll call it VR of T, is equal to the resistance R times the current flow through the resistor. Okay, so this is what we looked at in the last class. Okay, so for the resistor, we have that the voltage drop across the resistor is equal to the resistance times the current. Okay, an inductor, we usually denote 
by this kind of loopy looking thing here as an inductance L. Mm. Draw that down here. Okay. And we have that the voltage difference across the inductor is equal to the inductance L times the derivative of the current with respect to time. Hmm. It kind of looks familiar to something we saw. Um, okay, so I'll give a little intuition about this later. A capacitor is denoted uh, as follows, kind of as a pair of charged plates. Okay, um, as a capacitance C, and for the capacitor, we have that the current induced across the capacitor is equal to the capacitance C times the first derivative of the voltage difference across the capacitor with respect to time. Okay. And I'll rewrite this out uh, with the voltage. Sorry, this should be Vc of t. Uh, I'll write this out with the voltage on the left-hand side. Essentially, if we uh, integrate both sides, what we get is that the voltage across the capacitor is equal to one over C times the integral from negative infinity to T of the current I tau D tau. Okay, we're using a different uh, time variable inside the integral, but you can think of it as being proportional to the integral of the current. Okay, so I'll give you a little bit of a hydraulic analogy uh, to think about these different elements uh, and the circuit more broadly. So you can kind of think of a electrical circuit as being like a, a hydraulic system. Uh, in this analogy, the voltage, the voltage difference, you can kind of think of it as being analogous to the pressure, the pressure difference across the network. And the current you can think of as being analogous to the flow rate in the pipe. And this isn't a perfect analogy, but it'll help for our purposes, okay? So a resistor, you can kind of think of a resistor as representing the friction um, imposed by the pipe walls, right? So um, you can think of it as kind of, uh, you know, for, for a given flow rate, you know, if we decrease the size of the pipe, or if we cause it to be rougher, um, you'll need a higher pressure difference across that pipe to transmit the same amount of flow, right? So you can kind of think of a resistor as being like the resistance um, imposed by the pipe walls. Um, an inductor, you can kind of think of an inductor as being like the inertia of the water in the system, right? So like, if you think of a pipe system with water sitting in it, if you try to pump water through, that existing water in the pipe will push back, right? Uh, an inductor kind of does the same thing. It resists changes in the current within the circuit, right? So much like the inertia of the water in the pipe resists changes in flow, the inductor kind of smooths out changes in the current within the circuit. And a capacitor, this isn't a perfect analogy, but you can think of a capacitor as kind of being like a water tank okay, that stores that stores pressure. Okay? So um, it smooths out changes in pressure within the pipe network. So for instance, if you get a pipe network and it gets a burst in one of the pipes, if you don't have a tank in that system, you know, you'll lose pressure within the pipes very rapidly. Uh, but if you have a, a tank that's holding water at some elevation, that will smooth out that pressure drop, right? So the pressure in the system will decrease slowly because the tank will be uh, kind of stabilizing that pressure uh, in the system. So you can kind of think of these different circuit elements as kind of being analogous to a hydraulic system. Um, and that can help help your intuition for some of these circuit problems that we'll be dealing with uh, later in the course. Are there any questions about the RLC circuit and 
this hydraulic analogy. Now note that it's not a perfect analogy. There are some uh, caveats that I'd be happy to discuss, but I want to use it to kind of uh, give some intuition for those of you who haven't worked on circuits in a while, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and create the, um, the dynamical equation that describes the voltage and the current uh, within this RLC circuit. We can do that by applying Kirchhoff's laws. Okay, so we have two laws that we're interested in here. We have Kirchhoff's voltage law, and we have Kirchhoff's current law. Okay. And interestingly, these same laws apply to pipe networks as well. Uh, but Kirchhoff's voltage law states that the sum of the uh, differences in voltage uh, around each loop, or the sum of the voltage drops around each loop, has to be equal to zero. Note that this is the same for pipe networks, uh, where the sum of pressure differences around each loop has to equal zero. And we have Kirchhoff's current law, which states that the sum of the currents into each junction has to be equal to zero as well. Okay, so you can't uh, you can't have more current coming out of a junction than you have going in. Uh, and for each loop in the system, the sum of the voltage differences has to be equal to zero. Okay, so let's apply this to our uh, let's apply this to our circuit. Okay, we have, let's go around this loop and apply Kirchhoff's voltage law. We have the sum of the voltages from each of these constitutive equations. So we have our voltage input V of T minus our voltage drop across the resistor, which is given by this expression, minus our voltage difference across the inductor, which is given by this expression minus our voltage difference across the capacitor, which is given by this expression. So let's go ahead and write out this equation. Okay. From Kirchhoff's voltage law, we have that um, V of T, our voltage input is equal to the inductance L times DIT by DT plus R times IT plus the integral from negative infinity to T of one over C times I tau D tau. Okay, so all I did here was I went around that loop and I plugged in the expressions, uh, expressions for the voltage drops across each of those elements and uh, equated it to zero. Okay. Are there any questions about what I did here? Any questions? Okay, so let's go ahead and take this and put it in a more familiar form. I want to get rid of this integral here because we haven't really dealt with integrals so far. Um, so let's go ahead and just differentiate both sides. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and switch the left hand and the right side, hand side here uh, just so we have it in our same input output form as before. So let's apply d by dt of uh, L dit by dt plus R i t plus the integral from negative infinity to t of one over c i tau d tau is equal to d by dt of v t. You know, I'm just going to write it like this. OK, so let's go ahead and apply this derivative to each of the terms. Uh, what does this first term become? Right, so we can just apply it and it becomes L times the second derivative of the current with respect to time. Uh, this term here, first derivative, right? R times dIT by dt. All right, what about this term here? I know this is a T here. What is this? What does this term here become? Sorry? Yeah, right. 
So uh, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, if you take the derivative of this integral that's evaluated at t, you will get one over c times i of t. Okay. This is uh, important for your homework. On homework one, you'll be doing something similar, probably. Um, on the right-hand side, we just have dvt by dt. Okay. Uh, so this is our standard form for an LTI system, right? It's the exact same thing we've been seeing uh, for the other system we looked at. Let's go ahead and let's put this in operator form. So we can write it as LP squared. Sorry? Um, because I'm not making any assumptions about when the system started. <laughs> so if we knew that the system began at time zero, we could integrate from zero to T, but this will capture any any case, essentially, if we go from negative infinity to T. Okay. Yeah. So if, if we knew that the system started at zero, we could integrate from zero instead. Yeah. All right, good question. Okay, so let's take this. I'm just gonna actually go to the next page. Um, I'm gonna go to the next page actually. Okay, we can write this as in operator form as LP squared plus RP plus one over C all times the current I of T is equal to P applied to VT. Okay. And we can rewrite this again in our form with the output on the left-hand side, our input on the right-hand side. Because we're thinking about the voltage source as our input, let's think of the current as our output. Uh, so we have the I of T is equal to, all right, um, I'm going to have you help me here. What is our numerator? P. Okay, and our denominator? The denominator? Right. LP squared plus RP plus one over C. Right. Does this look familiar? It should. Right. So this is almost exactly the same as the structural system with damping that we saw earlier. Right. Uh, in fact, if you were to simulate the system or uh, you know operate the system in real life and produce a graph of the output it would be indistinguishable from a graph of the output of the structural system. In fact, both, both systems have the same, almost the same dynamical equation, okay? Uh, and specifically, kind of going with our analogy from earlier, we have that our inductance L is similar to our mass M. So again, as I stated, it kind of plays the role of inertia in this system. We have that our resistance is analogous to our damping. So remember what I said about how the resistance is kind of similar to the friction in the pipe walls. It's kind of playing the same role as damping in this case, trying to restore our system to a steady state. And we have that one over the conductance, or sorry, one over the capacitance is kind of similar to K, our stiffness. So our capacitor is kind of playing an analogous role to our spring in the structural system. And as I mentioned before, if you simulated this system for some uh, you know, instantaneous input at the first time step, you would get something that looks essentially exactly the same as the structural system, okay? because the equations that describe it are almost the same. Now, note that I say almost here because there is one important difference. Uh, and what is that? Yeah, there's a there's a P in the numerator. And what is that what is that P in the numerator doing? Where did it come from? 
Where did the P in the numerator come from? Right, it came from right here. So the P in the numerator kind of affects how the input is entering the system. In this case, um, our input is being differentiated, right? So the thing, the input that's driving the system is actually the derivative of the, of the voltage applied by the uh, battery, okay? So the numerator you can think of as usually relating to the input in some way, and the denominator represents the behavior of the system itself or the characteristics of the system itself, which is why it's often called the characteristic polynomial on the bottom. So later on, we'll be talking about the roots of both the numerator and the denominator. The roots will be uh, called the zero, uh, the roots of the numerator will be called the zeros, and they kind of affect how the input affects the system. And the denominator, its roots will be called the poles, and those will be the aspects of the system that we're primarily interested in controlling. Um, okay, great. Okay, are there any questions? Any questions on uh, the RLC circuit and how it might uh, how it relates to the structural system or anything that I've presented so far? So in this case, if the characteristic derivative of the velocity, like if I hook up a battery at time zero, it'll like there'll be a system response, but it'll approach steady state. But then with the structural system, like if I push on it and then I keep pushing on it, it's gonna like, it won't approach steady state. It'll keep getting pushed, right? Yeah, so I don't want to, I'm just kind of saying this off the top of my head, but you know, if you apply a step input right. to the RLC circuit, it will be the same as hitting the structural system with a hammer. Right. Okay, and we'll get into step inputs and impulse inputs uh, to systems in a, in a couple of classes. Yeah, so very good. Yeah, good intuition. Okay, are there any other questions on these different types of models, operator notation, anything we talked about today? Okay, well, with the last five or so minutes that I have, I'm going to give a quick intro to discrete time systems. Okay, we're not gonna have, uh, we're not gonna have much time to go into it, but I want to just go over discrete time systems very briefly. Okay, so discrete time models, and this information will be in your notes as well. Um, so, a discrete time system is defined by points or by a sequence of points equally spaced in time. Okay. And time in this case is indexed by our variable K. Okay, so our time is indexed by our time index variable, which we'll call k, and k is in the set of integers. Okay, so note that when I write this symbol here, when I write this symbol here, this means in. So this expression here means k is in the set of integers. We'll be using that notation uh, throughout the course. Okay, and a difference equation that describes these discrete time models um, is actually a set of equations. Okay. So, you know, we'll write, uh, typically when we write a difference equation, we'll write something of the form y at time index k plus one is equal to a times y at time k. Um, what this means, what this means is that for k uh, of any value, so for instance, if we start from zero, that y at time one is equal to a times y at time index zero, y at time two is equal to a times y at time index one, and so on, 
um, to infinity. You know? So uh, when we're looking at the solutions to difference equations, we're trying to find a form for y that satisfies all of these equations. A difference equation is really a set of equations. Okay. Um, let's see how much time I have. I have one minute. So um, just like before, we can define a standard form for LTI systems in discrete time. Um, we can also define an operator Q that much like our operator P, um, instead of applying a uh, derivative, what it does is it advances you to the next time step in sequence. Uh, and we can write systems like this in operator form as well. Okay, uh, I'm officially out of time, but I will, uh, I encourage you to look at your, uh, at the course packet for this section. There's a example of a discrete time system uh, that I think will be illustrated for you. If, uh, I may look at it at the beginning of class on, on Thursday, okay? So uh, with that, uh, I'd say uh, you're officially dismissed. I'm having office hours at 3.30 today up in my office and over Zoom if you have any questions about the homework. Uh, and with that, uh, have a great Tuesday. Thank you. <laughs>